There are three stages of HIV infection, the acute infection, the chronic or latent phase, and AIDS. The acute infection begins when HIV enters the body and establishes an infection. Some people get no symptoms during this period, though typically there will be flu-like or mononucleosis-like symptoms that decline over one to two months. Initially, replication occurs within immune cells at the site of infection, or in peripheral blood mononuclear cells. At the start of the infection process, HIV is usually R5-tropic, or M-tropic. Viral tropism is viral preference for particular co-receptors. M-tropic HIV is a strain of HIV that enters and infects cells that have CCR5 co-receptors. So again, T-cells, macrophages, monocytes, and dendritic cells. HIV is infamous for its high rate of mutation. HIV's RNA is about 9,200 nucleotide bases long, and reverse transcriptase introduces a mutation about once per 2,000 incorporated nucleotides. With the rate of viral replication being so high, a second strain of virus sometimes develops, X4-tropic or T-tropic HIV. T-tropic HIV binds to the CXCR4 co-receptor, which is found exclusively on T-cells. This is very bad news, as it speeds up viral progression. M-tropic and T-tropic strains can coexist in the body. There is also another reason why HIV might start off as M-tropic and eventually develop into a T-tropic strain. CCR5 is generally expressed by memory T-cells, while CXCR4 is expressed by naive CD4 T-cells. Normally, memory cells divide about 10 times faster than naive CD4 T-cells. Hence, T-tropic virus would be disadvantaged during early infection. However, as the disease progresses, naive cell division is as frequent as that of memory cells. That is when there tends to be a shift in tropism. Sentinel dendritic cells in mucosal tissue are one of the first cell populations that HIV encounters during sexual transmission. They are important in establishing a successful host infection from a small viral pool. HIV cannot productively infect the dendritic cells, since they have low levels of the receptors HIV needs to enter, and HIV gets degraded if internalized. However, dendritic cells capture virions that are later transmitted to T lymphocytes. HIV's GP120 sticks to the adhesion molecule DC sign and other C-type lectin receptors on the surface of dendritic cells. The virus is carried around in deep folds in the dendritic cell's surface. Dendritic cells travel to the lymph nodes, where there are tons of T-cells, HIV's ideal target, and the HIV begins to spread like wildfire. One way in which dendritic cells can transfer HIV to T-cells is via an infectious synapse in which the dendritic cells concentrate intact virions at the point of contact with a T-cell and induce recruitment of CD4 and CCR5 on the T-cell. The bulk of CD4-positive T-cell loss occurs in the first few weeks post-infection. The greatest number of casualties occur in the intestinal mucosa, where most of the body's lymphocytes occur and where the majority of T-cells express the CCR5 co-receptor. There is now a big spike in HIV replication and the amount of virus in a patient's blood. At this time, there can be several million viral particles per milliliter of blood, and there is a large drop in circulating helper T-cells. This acute viremia, in other words, virus presence in the blood, typically results in the activation of the CD8-positive cytotoxic T-cells, as well as B-cells. The cytotoxic T-cells kill infected cells, and B-cells produce antibodies. This counterattack lowers the amount of viral replication. T-cell counts rebound, though not to pre-infection levels. The infected individual now enters the chronic phase. During the chronic stage, little virus is detectable in the peripheral blood. However, HIV continues to replicate, causing general immune activation. Dendritic cells secrete inflammatory cytokines and interferons, which alter T-cell proliferation and differentiation, contributing to the immune dysregulation characteristic of the chronic stage. However, the immune response to HIV is not strong enough to stop viral replication from continuing within lymphoid tissues. Meanwhile, macrophages serve as long-lived reservoirs of virus, resistant to drug treatments and to attacks from the immune system. Infected macrophages accumulate large internal vacuoles containing virus. These vacuoles can lounge about inside the macrophage or travel into the plasma membrane, releasing their viral content into the extracellular space. Reasons for dropping CD4-positive T-cell counts differ in the acute and chronic stages. After initial infection, T-cell depletion results from HIV-induced cell lysis and the killing of infected cells by cytotoxic T-cells. However, at the chronic stage, generalized immune activation combined with the gradual loss of the ability of the immune system to generate new T-cells results in a slow decline in T-cell numbers. And now we come to the final stage of HIV infection, AIDS. A healthy level of T-cells is 500 to 1,600 cells per millimeter cubed. 
When T cells fall below 200 cells per millimeter cubed, the immune system is severely compromised. With the emergence from latency, there is a loss of normal lymph node architecture, resulting in persistent generalized lymphadenopathy. Opportunistic infections become common. Apart from weight loss, chills, fatigue, and a persistent fever, AIDS patients suffer from constant diarrhea from infectious parasites, recurring pneumonia, and fungal infections. Certain cancers that are normally rare, such as Kaposi's sarcoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, start to cause lesions of skin and other soft tissues. In the end, people don't die from HIV. They die from infections that a healthy immune system would fight off. Although there is currently no cure for HIV, antiretroviral medications can manage levels of HIV, keeping T-cell counts high enough to prevent the infection progressing into AIDS. This treatment is not a single medication, but a combination of drugs. Without treatment, the average survival time after infection is 11 years, and after diagnosis of AIDS, 3 years. With daily access to medication, HIV-positive people can expect to live almost as long as those without the virus, and are less likely to infect others. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. It would help me make more videos. And make sure to comment with any topics you'd like me to cover in future videos. Also, it would be really nice if you could support me on Patreon. Thank you.